Okay, so the open door policy holds if someone needs to go for any reason. Uh, as panelists and participants, we are not going to take it personally, and we encourage you not to take it personally if someone bolts or needs to ghost out. Um, I, I'm Avina Wing, and I am. It was a keynote, you probably all already know who I am, so I'm going to pass the talking stick. Hello. Hi, everyone. I'm Brody. Um, I am in school at Goddard College for counseling and psychology. Um, I'm looking to both build a practice out of LARPing and also advocate for policy that is more protective to people who deserve to be, everyone deserves to be exploring fantasy, but people who are traditionally um, disallowed the, abil the ab ability to explore uh, fantasy. Um, I'm Christopher Amherst. Um, I'm, I work at GW University, or George Washington University down in DC. Um, so part of the reason I'm here is um, my, a lot of my work involves um, crunching of data. Um, and so I've uh, done some analysis, uh, analysis of the LARP census as it pertained to Americans um, and what that showed in terms of the representation and demographics that existed within the American community. Uh, so one of the things that I'm really excited that Chris brings to the table and Brody too because they deal in statistics and in facts and so I can say I feel like LARP is intrinsically inherently sexist, classist, ableist but coming to the table of facts on the subject means that we can actually, uh, that there's no feelings involved um, and our in our conversations leading up to this panel, the um, the point that we reached is that when you look at the numbers and when you look at the hard data involved, LARP is inherently classist and sexist and racist and ableist and all sorts of other age, uh, ages, all sorts of ists. Um, and so when, um, when offered the opportunity, uh, it's kind of our responsibility to deconstruct that, that reality and observe it and understand more about how it influences how we interact with the, uh, with LARPing in general. With all of that understood, I would like to, if everybody buys in, uh, do the, what is everybody here to learn? Um, in order, because <coughs> once you get us going, we will talk for hours yeah. and have proven this. Yeah. Um, I would like to know what people here would like, are here to know or learn or glean. Um, so, and to introduce each other so that we're not the only voices in the room because we want your engagement in the conversation. So I'm going to start here. Who are you and what's one thing you want to come out of this panel with? Hello all, I'm John Paul of Minnesota. Um, I'm pronouns are he and his. Um, I've read a little bit of their stuff before so I'm interested in hearing uh, I, I promised your section was something like how you can use your privilege to deconstruct social barriers. And I was like, oh, oh. Can okay. I move in this way? Yeah, please. Okay. I'm Mari Brown, uh, she, and hmm, it's pretty much exactly that. It's um, rec being able to recognize um, and help others recognize what privilege and marginalization means and then the active strategies to transfer that. Um, in ways that are positive um, and iterative. Okay, next. Uh, my name is Ben Morrow. Uh, I use he. I'm here to listen. I specifically would love that, as John says, uh, the strategies for using what privilege you have to, to deconstruct and, and to try to dismantle um, systemic problems. And I'm very interested in trying to beat institutions. As opposed to people. Uh, next, I'm Rachel. I use she, and I'm here to find out how to take these populations that have been marginalized and had privilege wielded against them and make them feel safe in the community that I'm involved in. Okay. I'm Johannes. I go by he. I also read and published some of Christopher's work and I'm mostly here to listen and both for sort of the content in itself but also for to see the American perspective and context which has similarities but also differences to the Nordic one I'm in. Okay. Hello, 
I am Kit, they, them. As a genderqueer person, I like to sit in on conversations of marginalization because it is a problem that I notice all too often that people that recognize that marginalization is a problem still continue to marginalize while talking about it. I'm Bethany. I'm interested in the subject. Um, it's a hot topic at the university I work at as well. Um, and I would kind of like to know some of the statistics. Like, I would like to know the facts <laughs> um, because I only know what I've heard opinion-wise. <laughs> Uh, and I'm Hakan, uh, he, him, and uh, the big reason I'm here is just to get a better understanding of whatever unconscious biases or say, privilege I might be bringing to my design work, and uh, be a better at the recognize and recognize Sure. My name is Steven, uh, pronouns he. I am a researcher working on my PhD, doing a lot of work in marginalization, specifically looking at what is referred to as decentered marginalization, so populations that are not normally marginalized, that are in certain circumstances marginalized. And a lot of my work in looking and game studies, which I have to admit is in my major field, my major field is about masculinity, but my secondary field of game studies is looking at the idea, especially around what's going on in Gamergate, and all the shock of the sexism that's going on in Gamergate, of realizing that's the same sexism that we see in the general population. So a lot of uh, something I'm working on as far as future research that my PhD advisor hates because it's taking me away from my dissertation is looking at these unique populations such as LARPers where there's this expectation of inclusion and individuals being somewhat surprised when it's not there but it mirrors the standard community as far as their level of isms. Uh, next. Uh. Hello, I'm Anna, I'm from Russia. I just want to understand uh, what is marginalization here and uh, if we are going to discuss some questions about like LARPers as a marginalized uh, um, people inside the big society, uh, if it is so here in the US or if it isn't. Because in Russia we, we are trying to, like, to make LARP to be something uh, not, not very strange and awkward. Um, so I'm prepared to listen to what the situation is here. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Margaret, and uh, I am, uh, I've been LARPing for about 25 years. I'm very interested in connecting communities together at this particular point uh, in, in my interest. Um, and in doing so, uh, with that networking, it's very important for me to understand uh, marginalization from all different aspects to, to make LARPs and communities more inviting. Um, Sir Cameraman? Oh, I'm the cameraman. <laughs> do you have things, that, do you have a name? No, my name is Steve. Hi, Steve. Hi. And um, I am the cameraman, but I'm obviously a cameraman here because I'm interested in the topics in general. Do you have anything in specific you'd like to learn or ask or... No, I'm pretty much a walking osmosis factory right now. <laughs> whatever, whatever happens, I just want to absorb it. And awesome. I, I run conventions and realize that my behind-the-scenes crew does not often get acknowledged, and it's important to me that we acknowledge that you're doing an awesome thing. So thank you. I, uh, I want to say two things this year. There's a list of everyone's name and pronoun, which is so cool. Um, <laughs> that is awesome. Um, and uh, also, I have some statistics here I was going to read off. These are from the LARP census. I'll start with the LARP census, and then I'll go to uh, my research, which is fledgling. But um, LARP census, so 92% uh, of LARPers are white. 61% of LARPers are men. Um, let's see. 24% are 25 to 29 years old. 19% is of age, 19% are 20 to 24 years old. Uh, so that's 45% is within those, those age groups. Question? Is that worldwide or US? That is the totality of the, uh, the LARP census, so worldwide. Um, mine is, is um, less focused. Mine uh, is 44% American. Um, but my research results are 85% white, 44% men, 
50% straight, 85% cisgendered, um, and uh, actually also 45% in those, those nine years of uh, 20 to 29. So uh, when we talk about margins, we're talking about um, some relation to a dominant identity. We can use those statistics to think about what the dominant identity is, both in participants and people who are creating the content and cultures that we engage in. Was it a theoretical conversation that we wanted to pursue further, or was did we actually have data on uh, creators and what their breakdown was, or was that a wish list item? Um, I mean, we broke and we looked at staff, and when I looked at the American numbers, a majority, and it was about ninety percent of the individuals that I looked in for the analysis we did were were staff that were creators. So in fact, um, when I say when um, when I broke down the numbers, it was 92% white, um, 65, 66% male, um, and uh, of the 92% white, you had 8% uh, was individuals of color, color across generations, um, and about two to three. Per, uh, let me take about it. It was about three to four percent were Hispanic. Um, so it, it effectively, the, the odd thing about that all though was, what, and what was interesting is we kind of have this construct that, um, because we see it all the time when we go to LARP, that the majority of people that are running these games are white middle class males, typically between 18 to 29. But the reality was that when you look at who's actually doing support, it is more, that there is a higher likelihood that it's going to be a woman, that they're not necessarily going to be white, that they actually can be a person of color. Um, so it's not, you know, the, the perception of white male as the, the GM or the organizer really isn't true. The people that are actually stepping up to be staff are not them. But because we see that 92, that because we see that white middle class cis male at the forefront, that's, it kind of, it creates that confirmation bias for us. Um, but yes, white women, people of color were, are actually more likely to participate as staff than white males were. Um, and I think this is one of those, one of those issues is kind of, you know, they're kind of in behind the scenes invisible in this situation which to me is kind of a, a wrong perception because they're the ones that are more likely to step up and say, I'm going to make this community a better place. I'm going to make this community happen. I'm going to do the things to help support the players and, you know, and uh, create these stories. Because the one thing that was, the one thing that we all agree on is that we're there to hang out with our friends and we're there to create a good story. Everyone agrees on that. After that, what you what motivates you to play entirely depends on the background you bring to the table. So that's a really important thing. And so in the conversation about how to distribute privilege, one of the things that I think is really powerful, uh, Chris, I'd like you to talk about that breakdown of what people are looking for based on background, because this profoundly startled me. I was like, wait, I, I would not have anticipated that. Um, so the interesting thing is this, there is a definite gender divergence. And I will apologize um, for anyone that is transgender or genderqueer. I didn't have any data uh, at all available for that analysis, so I can't speak to um, what your motivations may be or what you're interested in, because that data wasn't available. Um, can you just, I'm so sorry, but can you, I think I misunderstood the main point. <laughs> so I think before it goes any further, I want to, because, and I, maybe I'm the only one, it sounds like you said that the people whose face is at the front that everybody sees tend to be white male, but the people who are behind the scenes are, tend to be more female, and that therefore there are more women that are involved than we might think there are, yes. but they're just behind the There's the a scenes. perception of the white male as the organizer, but when you look at, when you look at people that volunteer at staff or have, have, when there was a question as to whether you are staff, there, the, the number of people that were, uh, when I broke down the cohorts in terms of people of color and women, yes. um, they were far more likely to be, have checked the, the checkbox to say they were staff than white male, white men were. 
So one of the, to tie this back together, um, one of the things that was very notable in our conversations was that we, we started to realize that it mirrors a lot of how uh, offices and other cultures work mm -hmm. in that the fact that uh, the, the people who were sweating blood over the product uh, were not necessarily the people that were most visible and uh, also, I would posit that there's a high likelihood that they are doing support roles that are highly undervalued and are not given the same status or acknowledgement as creators and that this has a significant impact and, uh, uh, yes. No, I don't mean to interrupt what you're No, saying. I wasn't. I think it absolutely does. I'm interested before we go further in, in just, uh, Chris, you, you uh, just summarizing a little bit of what your sample study was, uh, where it was, just demographically. So, um, I, uh, I'm trying to pull up the article so I can give you the exact quote, but I, the, the Somakota article has all of the explicit and gory statistical details. Um, so, of, of the 29,000 um, that had responded to the LARP census, I had narrowed it down to about, uh, about 56, 100, 5,900 individuals that we had uh, consistent data for demographics. So we uh, could identify the, the gender that they had indicated, um, the ethnicity they had indicated, what their age was. Um, and we also, I also kind of created a proxy for socioeconomic status um, because the, the census didn't ask a question about how much, what's your income. It didn't ask how much money you make. Um, so there's no way of, of accurately gauging it, but what we created, what I created was a proxy that looked at uh, in terms of the events you participated in, how far did you go, or how long did you play? Um, because that gave a good correlation of the resources you had available to do things. Um, so if you were only a day's drive away, you could assume that you have a car and you have enough means to pay for gas and, and gas to get back and forth. But if you're going to a foreign country or another continent, you have an entirely different pool of resources. Um, factoring all of that in, um, the interesting thing of the demographics was generational. Um, if you held for generation, what you saw was the baby boomers, um, that baby boomers had about a 66, 44, or 66, I'm trying to do the math in my head real quick. 34. Uh, 34. The 66, 34 breakdown in terms of men and women. Um, it gets better when you go to Generation X, it gets to be more of about a 60, 40 split. When you get to the millennials, it gets closer to gender parity um, in terms of, it was about a 40, 57, 43 split. Um, in terms of people of color, um, there was the it's predominantly it's like ninety percent male across the board. I mean, it's it, to say that that LARP is a white a white hobby is kind of understating the fact that it's nine out of ten players are going to be white. So for baby boomers, it's worse because that got to be about ninety four. When it gets to the generation X, it's about ninety two, and it improves when we hit the millennials at about 88. It's about, when you get to the millennials, it's about eight or nine percent is someone of color that's participating in the community. And looking at the Hispanic population, it goes from about two percent in the baby boomers to about four or five percent when you hit the millennials. So what you, what you see is the same, what you see, what's interesting is that demographics trace to what you're seeing in actual real populations. So we know, we know that the millennials and the generation that's coming after it are going to be not white. You know, the majority of the people are going to be someone of color or Hispanic. Um, and you see that just pure generational wise. That's what's happening. It's basically take a slice of the country, they're going to be playing LARP somehow. Um, the breakdown on age gets to be about. 18 to 29 is 66% of the population that plays. So anything outside of that, um, is, you know, it's the rest of it is going to be Generation X and baby boomers. So the majority of people playing are under the age of 30. Um,
me just say how impressed I am by the fact that he is doing this entirely by memory. Yes. That astounds me. I can't me. get my article, so. Uh, the situation in my community looks like we had uh, started everyone when we were students and everyone had no money and so on. Uh, I mean, we don't have players of about like 60 or 70. Like average, uh, we are like in our 20s and 30s and there are some players who are 45, for example. And there are like, I know two people who are elder than 50, for example. So uh, when people started uh, like growing up and earning money, uh, we it's like capitalization of LARPs that is going on now. And uh, when, I, when, for example, when we are organizing a convention, uh, guys are saying like, let's make the entry fee like, say, twenty dollars. And I say, no, not not everyone in Saint Petersburg can afford it. Let's make it like the minimum, and like let's do it like we. Uh, I know that foreign uh, larvas do like if you may afford it, just do it. And the the reply was like. Oh, we don't need poor lapers any longer, and I was really offended because I know I know lapers who have been lapping for like 20 years now, but they work in a nursery school, and they're like what they earn is about like 200 dollars per month, and it's a really low salary even for Russia, for Saint Petersburg. Uh, so they uh, they and this they continue lapping, and what what we are having now is that. There are big labs which have entourage and banners and people can afford costumes that cost, let's say, $500. And they uh, are running these labs and many people are coming, like 500 people, 700 people. But many people who live in the other regions and they would probably afford buying train tickets and paying, uh, say, $15 entrance fee. But they don't go to these labs because they feel ashamed that don't have that they don't have such great costumes. So we are starting to have old-fashioned kind of laps that don't need anything except for some simple clothing and your imagination. Yeah. Yeah, and a couple of I don't know ropes and pieces of cloth and these big uh, and expensive laps. And that's what I dislike really. But I don't know what to do because uh, I. Sometimes I can afford to go into these expensive LARPs, but not all. But I don't think it's a, the problem of those who don't earn a lot. But people who are in charge of many LARPs, they often earn a lot of money, and they can like put this money into the LARP, because our Russian LARPs are often like mi have minus budgeting. So uh, game masters don't, don't get any money feedback, they spend money. That's a really important point, and that is going to become something that I integrate into my thought processes, that my privilege should not set the threshold for what I expect everybody coming into the environment's privilege to be. That's really powerful for me. Thank you. I'm going to interject the point. Um, I also think there is a, there actually is a good model for how to address some of these the, the economics, the, econ, um, the economic barriers. Um, LARP Fund, one of the, the projects that's being run in the Nordic countries, is an interesting example of people basically creating a pool of resources that LARPs can tap into to reduce that threshold. Um, and it's a brilliant model because it means that me, someone that like me who could afford to go to those expensive LARPs, I can put money into LARP, something like LARP Fund, and that can enable a LARP to apply to apply to that fund to go. We would like to make this LARP accessible to people that can't pay the full price. How can we do so? What is that? It's not exactly how it works, but kind of. Yeah. Like people donate money, and then a LARP can apply and say, "We want money to cover four tickets." Yeah. And then the LARP can decide if they give away four tickets or for free, or if they subsidizing eight tickets with half price, etc. But but LARP fund is it is completely donor based. There's no yep. money coming in. It's only European LARPers monthly donating. Yep. Yeah. It, it, is it like compulsory, or what? It, it, it's uh, it's it's a just a hobby project from some Swedish LARPers. Mm -hmm. So they is, it, they've been it advertising it, and so people like I donate money because I think it's a good thing, and I think they fund it's like. 
one LARP every other month or one LARP every month or something. So they get a couple of thousand euros every year, I think. Mm. So it, it's for all the country, one fund? It's, it, you can apply if your LARP is being organized in the Nordic countries or by Nordic organizer group. Okay. But so I know that Fairweather Manor, for instance, have, have had LARP fund tickets, even though it's run in Poland, mm -hmm. because it's Nordic organizers. So it's a Swedish fund? Yes, mm -hmm. or it's run by a group of Swedish LARPers. None of them are here, sadly. But, but I will say that Simon's, I think Simon's team is the one. Uh, you can talk to the people that have organized the LARP fund, uh, and they'll be happy to share insights into the model. So some they the Mo and Carl Bergström are the people who are mainly running it. But you could also ask Klaus, who's actually gotten money from it, how yeah. it works okay, for them. Okay, great. Who is Thank it? you. I will also be creating a Google Doc uh, that will be a living record of things that come out of this conversation that I'll be inviting people to drop questions or links or pertinent details into. And if you don't mind adding those names to it, maybe a link to the project so that uh, people can access it and have access to that information. Here in Austin, um, probably about four months ago, maybe five, there's actually this giant shit storm on Facebook. And it started, I think, in Amgard, moved to DR, moved to Planetfall, moved around the community here, and became very toxic regarding costuming necessities. And like what, what the level was, like, oh, well, if you can't meet this threshold, then don't even come to the game kind of thing was going on. And, and it was very interesting to see how each community handled that um, and how each community responded to it ultimately. And I really like that in each case, the game owners came out and said, you know, this is what we're looking for. And, and almost universally, it was do what you can with what you have. We understand that not everybody has the same means to do this. We would rather that you came and played and had an awesome time with us rather than sitting at home going, oh, well, I can't afford garb, so I guess I don't go. You know, and if it's garb or eat, and there are people that, that LARP with me that have to make that decision sometimes. And ultimately what ends up happening is I'm like, oh, whoops, I guess the sandwich just fell off the bandwagon this week. You know, here you go, because I can't stand watching people have to make that decision again, like they can't afford a meal plan if they afford their ticket, you know, and things like that. So, so that's been something that's been very powerful here in the Austin area, and it's nice to hear echoed from other areas that, you know, that's not something that's just isolated here. Yeah. Um, more and then Johannes, um, and then Bethany. I just wanted to say something about the costuming thing. Um, we're, we're as the as the founders of what would be a very high ticket price LARP, <laughs> right? Um, that uh, one of the things that we had to, to try to take a look at was um, that price over because there's no it's different compared to campaign LARP. So what you get for that prize and those sorts of things. So we were looking at costuming, and it's one of the reasons why we have loaned robes and free ties um, and that go on, and it doesn't matter what you wear underneath it. Now there's, um, there's still, um, no matter how many times we say that, right? And we actually have um, statistically very high percentage of first time workers coming to our game, which is awesome. Um, and something that we really try to try to do. Um, the fear of, and comparison of the costuming is real and paralyzing, and it's a type of community ethos that can beyond what the designers can say or do. And so designers can come out and say, "It's okay, come as you are. Um, you know, just we want you to play." And then what happens when you get there? Or even in, in the case of this is social media, people are posting pictures of the stuff that they're making and that they're doing, and the people there's a disconnect between the the designers um, and the the, or the documents are saying one thing, and then the feeling, mm -hmm. um, which may or may not be accurate, it may uh, <coughs> be very real, um, and what happens on the site can happen both in character and out of character, where people are judged for their costuming, and in some of these games, there are in-game economies <laughs> um, where uh, things are valued. And so um, it's one of those alignment things that is hard, where privilege can be insidious. Um, and, and absolutely, and go from there. So. Um, yes. I have a few things to say about costuming in class, because 
So I come from, if you look at Swedish art, I don't know how many of you have seen discussions like in North Haven on Facebook, but costuming levels are generally extremely high. And it's, it's a combination of things. Some things are hard to replicate here because like anyone who's in school will have access to sewing machines and cheap materials. So if, you have, if you're a student, also since we don't have any tuition or anything, people have time when they're students. So students can sew a lot of stuff. So costuming levels are generally very high with young LARPers because they have time and people who are older and have high paying jobs and then everyone sort of in the middle are the one having a hard time. But there are some equalizing things being done that I think are replicatable. There's like the biggest blockbuster fancy art campaign is Heart of War or Kickstarter. And they have a Facebook group called the, the Loaning Central for Heart of War. So because they have one like major LARP every other year and then smaller LARPs throughout the year. So people will ask like, oh, I want to try playing this, this faction. Does anyone have an armor I can borrow or a costume? Because people will sew up costumes and use them once or twice and then have them lying around. So you can do this sort of resource centers where like, I, I could spend time and money on sewing this once. I'll use it once a year, but I won't use it the other time so you can borrow it. They also do workshops. So for instance, it's very cool with crossbows, but it's super expensive to buy crossbow bolts. So they will organize buying materials together in the cheapest possible way and have workshop days where they teach you. So people will make their own bolts super cheaply together and then you keep the cost down and you don't discuss money. You just say like, oh, you wanna, you're playing a character that you want crossbow bolts, sign up for the workshop. They find some public funds, but not much, but they will find a workshop to be at. And you can do that with costuming too, like, oh, we're being in this medieval setting or this setting which has costume you can't buy off the shelf. Let's organize a workshop where are people who have time and want to can come and sew together. We'll show you how it's done. You can pay for the material cost and you won't have to buy costuming for hundreds of dollars. You have materials for tens of dollars. That's amazing. There's a thing in American culture that, is, uh, especially in urban American areas, called uh, maker spaces, and it would be really interesting to start prompting LARPers to develop a maker space workshops where they they tackle and these sorts of things. Maker spaces very often have sewing stuff. Like the things that will be advertised are the laser cutters and 3D printers, right. but they will have sewing and crafting stuff. And as long as some people are members, you can easily do LARP crafting at maker spaces, and they're in like, every city. Amazing. I want to talk just a little bit about, um, you prompted before, about the stuff that I'm doing at my chapter of Dystopia Rising. Um, I. <clears throat> All right, so we do skill shares. That's something that I've initiated, is doing a skill share. Um, because while the information on how to make up offer, it's integral to the game is available, um, getting the requisite resources and time and oversight to make sure you haven't wasted those resources is something that people want and need access to. So um, that is something that, that we've started doing and um, that we weren't doing before, so I, I don't know what other communities are doing, but that's something that we had to initiate change with and spent time and labor doing. Uh, another thing is uh, <coughs> we degendered the bathrooms. That was something that uh, we've done here did there, um, it was something no one thought about until, I didn't even think about it because I have so much privilege despite my gender identity, like I'm so used to acquiescing, someone who is more visibly queer than I was was like, it sucks we have to use these two bathrooms, so I was like, ah, fix it, sorry. <laughs> 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 it's a reasonable reaction. You just yes. channeled me, yes. <laughs> good job. Um, what else have we done? Oh, usually, so another thing is also, um, some active engagement because like dystopia rising is and it's just be speaking to my experience it's a sandbox game um ours is a little more plot heavy but you know you can go get off into any trouble that you want um there are some expectations for what you should be able to do though to engage in that trouble um usually like a confidential and uh, outreach for like what are this is what larping is you know if they've never learned before do you have any concerns do you have any things that you might be worried about for your accessibility and sometimes it won't be a big deal other times it's like i sleep with a cpap machine in a game where you can be hit by zombies at four in the morning. Um, and creating personalized uh, care and responses for people like that so they know that they're valued and that we also are just like, do whatever you want, and then they have complications due to doing the thing, whatever we told them to do. Like creating oversight and um, acknowledgement for those changes that, that want to happen. Um, 
I also wrote down this thought here for anyone designing stuff. Um, I don't know where it came from, but um, I wrote down awareness of field, an awareness of what's already being done around you. If you're creating games that mimic uh, games that are already accessible to the population around you, the people who aren't playing still aren't going to be able to play. The people who can play just have a new option. Um, I live in the woods on a mountain. I can only get to my DR game because people are driving there. Um, there may be games happening in uh, Boston, which is two hours away from me, uh, freeform games that I really want to be playing. I can do more good work with myself and other people if I'm playing those games. Um, but now my choices aren't whether or not I go to there or go to my DR game. It's more often, um, can I go to this game or the, the Wild West game down the road? You know, they both take the same amount of resources, the same type of investment and stuff. It doesn't allow me to supplement my play, it doesn't allow me to bring new people in, and that's something that I think, um, actually the people who made Dystopia Rising are making a new game called Utopia Descending. Um, and I uh, think clever with the name. Um, and they have done, they've taken some awareness from uh, what they've experienced. Uh, one thing <coughs> they've integrated in their game is um, diegetic reasons for disparities in costuming. There are three tiers of, pl of character you can be going from a t-shirt, you know, or like Under Armour and, and camo pants to, you know, full prosthetics. And that it means that you're not, to be like, you know, in another game, you're not a shitty elf. You're just a different type of elf. Uh, Bethany had something, and then we are at the 15 minute mark. So I'm gonna uh, turn it over to the panelists to wrap up thoughts after Bethany asks her question. Try and phrase this like a good question. Um, so I feel like we've danced around um, the subject a little bit in terms of what marginalized populations represent and what privilege represents because it seems like we focus mostly on lack of economic resources. And, and when I think about some privilege on a larger scale, so for example, when people are talking about white privilege in relationship to police interactions, um, it, it doesn't seem to matter what economic level um, a person of color is at. They, they are having similar experiences with police interactions where, um, you know, whether, whether real or imagined, there is fear and distrust um, of the police population and a feeling that they as a group are being selected um, to be treated differently. And a lack of knowledge in general, you know, the privileged population, um, the white population, that that is happening. Like, a lack of knowledge understanding. Yes. So I'm wondering if the data that you have or the research that you've done um, has any information about how that's happening in the LARP community, not just with organizers, but with players. Um, so what, what are the things that are happening that, that are making these populations marginalized other than economic resources? Oh, I, I don't even want to answer that one because I do have an answer for you. <laughs> I, I really didn't like So when I crunched the ethnicity data, um, one of the things I did was flag how people refer to themselves. Um, it was, what I was looking was for cultural markers on um, your ethnic identity and how you refer to yourself. And what I found was that there were, that, and I will quote the statistics, um, for Generation X, um, when we looked at racially charged language, specifically how you refer to yourself, 4.1% of the male population used racially charged language when they ident were identifying themselves. 38 of the female population did so as well. Uh, can we define racially, racially charged language? White ass cracker, honky. Um, oh, because these were fields they could fill in. This, yeah. yeah. So this is what we're. These. These are the nicest things I could use in a in a forum. Uh, there are were other answers that um, I would, <laughs> I think, should not generally be used in a public setting. Um, but we this, appreciate your discretion. <laughs> <laughs> this was referring um, to themselves. They yeah. Yeah. This was how they refer to themselves. Yeah. Um, Funny guys. For millennials, this gets worse. It was 5.8% of the male population and 4.9% of the female population. And this went across socioeconomic status. This, this, this was just, if you looked at generationally, this was the breakdown. Um, I, 
what I can't answer for you. I can tell you that this happened, that this is how people referred to themselves because they were given a free text option and that's how they identified themselves. Um, what I can't tell you is why. I, can't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know if that is, a, that is a response to, as a pushback to seeing um, people come into the community that these people aren't comfortable with, or whether that is uh, speaking to a larger question as to what's going on in the country. Um, but this is happening in the communities. People are, I can't imagine someone referring to themselves as a white ass cracker is not thinking things and expressing that in their game space in an appropriate manner. I, I, I worry that this person, that these type of people that are identifying themselves this way are walking into game games and using language and actions and behaving in ways that um, drive other people away. And using alibi and being like, well, that's just what my character would do. Yeah, I can make some speculation about that um, due to my research. Um, I also received things like that, uh, which I was saying in my other presentations, that I received some responses where people said that asking about labels, labels which contextually identify marginalization, um, was unnecessary in doing the marginalizing, that like that their community was fine, they didn't think about their friend, I mean, we've all heard this, I don't see color like that, and, and being reminded of it was them being reminded of that construct and being forced to acknowledge it and being threatened by it and treating it frivolously because it doesn't apply to them. And being asked about these, I think, in a research setting, being confronted with these divisions and asked to identify as a someone who benefits from it because as people of privilege, they don't have to, I don't have to be conscious of my privilege because I am normative. And meanwhile, the people who are non-normative are being continually reminded that they are non-normative. I think that's why that comes up. I think that's also what I was saying. What I was saying before about um, euphemism in terms not acknowledging things that um, because we're not naming things, they operate on the benefit of the doubt, and people are allowed to continue. Like someone tells a rape joke, and people laugh about it in such a way where the person offended by that needs to disrupt that social atmosphere <coughs> to get their point across, or say nothing and not trust the people around them for the rest of their game and their time in that community, and potentially end up being held hostage in that community because they have nowhere else to go. Um, um. I'm actually going to ask people to hold questions unless it's directly and immediately. Okay. Yeah. And it was related to that. Just the fact that in discourse analysis, there's a lot of new research looking at how individuals who are in the dominant group are modifying the discourse so they become the marginalized group. Yes. And that's exactly what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, that's a threat that we have as LARPers where we're fed these um, these stories of right and wrong and we're always on the side of the protagonist or whenever we're an antagonist, it's usually justified and cool. I think that we grow up on these stories and we internalize them so we assume like, you know, it's bad to be racist. I'm a good guy, I'm not racist. I think that's what people do. So when they're reminded of these things, they get squeamish and they don't want to have that discourse. Um, I. I had this happen to me at lunch today, where I said, okay, pause, there's there's a situation and it needs to not happen. And then I went back to the person and said, okay, I, I understand that like you didn't understand why there, I was throwing an X card at the table, uh, but um, you're coming from a place of privilege and I need you to understand that uh, at the point that someone says X card, you don't get to argue about it and your desire to continue the conversation is not more important than my request for a social pause so that we can all take our communal temperature and figure out whether or not it was a transgression. I'm not telling you it's a transgression. I am asking for the space to examine it and decide as a table, as a community, we are a 10 person community right now, whether or not there was a transgression and do we just, can, can we just sidestep it? And I, I was asking, let's just talk about something else. Let's not go there right now. And uh, what I got was, well, I really feel like in the spirit of inclusion, you are telling me that I'm not really welcome here. And I went, well, I'm gonna try once to reintegrate you into the conversation. And it didn't work. And so now I'm like, okay, well, clearly privilege is more important than engaging in the conversation and being a participant and therefore, we won't be having these conversations anymore. 
Um, <coughs> and uh, it's really important to me. Like the, the, the key point that I have on the, the redistributing privilege and the how do we create systems is that being aware that when someone says quietly, hey, that's not enough to work, that people with privilege and status are fundamentally responsible for saying, hey, you're right. Um, if someone says, turning the lights on is a really tiny thing so that I can participate in the conversation. It's really important that me, with two eyes that work relatively well, say, oh, let me just share my status within the community to add my voice to yours to say, hey, maybe we should have a further conversation about what our needs are versus our wants and our desires. And so, um, listening for the little stuff that happens quietly at the side or for people who are saying nothing, they are probably being marginalized. Uh, so we have time for uh, one quick point from each of you. Okay, so. <laughs> so I'm, I'm actually gonna go back to, so we were talking about the, the, the narrative, you know, the, 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 the you know, right and wrong and the protagonist and antagonist and and actually, I think we didn't touch on motivations, and this is one of the points I'm going to make. Oh, what we, when we talk about protagonist and antagonist, we're talking about, you know, we oftentimes, a lot of what we talk about in our, our games is very drawn off of, you know, uh, the default privilege. Like, this is, this is the people that are creating this are, are writing the stories that they want to play. But that's not why everyone comes to the game. Um, so I'm going to throw a little knowledge in your guys' direction of what you will find in the LARP census if you look at it. People of color, one of the predominant motivations they have in the top three, it rated less than third on all the groups I analyzed, they come to play because they believe that one of the things that brings them to game is overcoming challenges. Now I'll let you all parse why that may be the case, but that was the, one of the reasons they indicated that they come to game. If you're a woman, one of the reasons that you came to game a lot of the times is because you were looking for, how did I phrase it here? Um, you want to have emotionally intimate scenes. You wanted to be emotionally open. You wanted to be self-reflective. Basically, you were looking at teach me about myself, participate in dramatic moments in which other characters are very emotional, and enjoy private and personal action, interactions with just a few other characters. The other catch that I found for women was that because men have made the environment we're in somewhat unsafe, mm -hmm. they play in their private homes. A lot of the times they <coughs> will actually subvert the dynamic to create and to play their in games that they want to play in their own private homes where they can maintain that safe space. So that's, if I want to leave you guys with anything, it's to think about that when I, as a designer, say this is the type of story I want to write, that's not going to be the type of stories that other people want to participate or interact with. Okay. Um, in the, the spirit of um, what I was saying about being a, a protagonist and an antagonist and not willing to give up being a protagonist because it, it makes you feel vulnerable, I think that's something that we need to do, is not say that we're bad people <laughs> because we have privilege, but that like, um, I'm speaking as someone of privilege, um, to acknowledge that we have been antagonistic um, in creating these spaces, and um, that there are people in the community, including us, who have been selfish with these spaces because we prize them, because they're places where we get to be a more powerful version of ourselves, or a validated version of ourselves, and be able to give resources to listen to and participate in the work and words being done by people who aren't prioritized in our communities, by asking what would make this be safer, or what do you want to do? Um, and do corrective work. Be in the constant process of becoming whatever marginalized part of yourself that you can access. Not to disempower yourself, but to relate to those who don't have the ability to empower to your degree. Um, it's almost a shame that I have one more point that I want to make, because that was really powerful. Thank you. Um, we as a community need to be prepared for the fact that these conversations are causing a documented uh, sociological impact 
and that means that there is going to be and is being a backlash. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, historically, sociologists have maintained that you cannot study a movement and you cannot anticipate it or guess where it's going uh, until you are out of it and 10 years past it. Uh, but because we have such a vast amount of knowledge available to us now, we can look objectively at what is happening around us and know that um, we are we are watching an a, a uh, environment a atmosphere of pushback, and so expanding privilege, sharing privilege with people, decolonizing uh, larping and gaming and geek spaces, and uh, being unselfish with our space means that we also have to be prepared to be advocates and protectors and to get it wrong and to go too far and to be too cautious and to be too empathetic and to have our hearts too far out there because uh, if we are coming from a position of privilege, it is better to err on the side of people who are walking in without privilege and to take the role of protecting them from that backlash because we have the privilege to take that in. So thank you all. Uh, I will start a Google document where we can continue this conversation because I, uh, this hour was like one tenth of the conversation that we collectively have had on this conversation so far. And I think everybody has valuable, interesting things to add. And I really appreciate you all. I look forward to reading your article. If you could put links to your articles there, that would be great. Yeah. If, you're um, if anyone wants to learn with me, if you've got like a little hashtag feminism game or anything like that, please just ask me.